Jamie, we recently put out a film with Daniel uh, called War on Sense Making that did really, really well. Kind of slightly unexpectedly, it sort of really seemed to catch the zeitgeist. And I know that you've been thinking a lot about some of the same topics in that film. What were you struck by and what did you feel that you wanted to add to that particular conversation? I think the first thing, I was just amazed at Daniel's absolutely fluid, flawlessly structured stream of consciousness, laying that out for whatever it was, an hour and 40 minutes. Um, just thinking, holy shit, Daniel, you know, like that, that, is, that is some exquisitely uh, articulated and presented um, you know, thesis points and, and kind of the ecology of the information space he was describing. And I, I found myself at the end, you know, uh, Daniel and I have riffed on those topics before when we hanging out. And on two occasions prior, I'd, I'd even told my wife, Julie, I was like, um, yeah, I think we got to the point in the conversation where he almost told me the answer, you know, because he was introducing the, that brilliant metaphor of, hey, what does, you know, we've talked about rival risk games and how that buggers up the information ecology. And you end up in win-lose dynamics, and you end up with all of the things that pollute the information ecology, the, the virtue signaling, the mis-signaling, the dif distinctions between truth and truthfulness, right? the, the weaponization of content and misinformation and all of those things. And then he was saying, well, hey, uh, there are examples of anti-rivalrous cooperation and introduce the ideas of our organs, all doing the thing, the liver does the thing, the kidney does the thing, but together somehow they boot up into us. Uh, the idea that one eye sees without depth perception, you know, or peripheral vision, you put two together and you get parallax, binocular vision, you know, fantastic. Um, and, I was, and, and I thought, oh, fantastic, he's actually gonna finish the story. And that's exactly where it ended uh, in your guy's interview as well. And, and, and I think he just hinted at it at the end, which was, you know, the reason that our organs can do that wonderful anti-rivalrous cooperation into something more than they are as separate parts is because they don't have egos and agency. And the moment we introduce egos and agency into the game, we're back to the bottom of the slide of game A, rivalrous competition, and game theory dynamics. And that is, you know, between uh, Brett Weinstein's uh, arguments on evolutionary biology and Jordan Hall and Daniel's discussions of game theory, you can sort of feel like, man, that, those are incredibly dense forces. You know, you can create castles made of sand on top of those based on what we'd like the world to be. But millions of years of evolutionary selection and encoding plus our cognitive biases and heuristics or sort of rules of thumb and shortcuts for the way we do things and think things, uh, that sort of equals game theory in a nutshell. And I've been increasingly um, sort of in grim awe and respect and appreciation for game theory dynamics and largely full hat tip uh, to Jordan and Daniel for uh, articulating and expressing that so well. So for me, the question is, is how do we break out of that centrifugal force uh, of that rock bottom denominator? And, and so that's really, that's, that's the kind of uh, the stuff that got me thinking, having, having seen Daniel's brilliant kickoff to this and sort of really interested in exploring, well, how do we do better than that? In a simple way, because obviously game A, game B as, as nomenclature uh, is probably new to folks. I think that was uh, Jim Rutt and Jordan's articulation um, from several years back uh, that is now kind of uh, coming back into the conversation. Uh, but just to render it in terms that maybe people might be more familiar with is, uh, and this is an analogy, not necessarily a direct one-to-one, -one, but in many respects, game A, kind of the way we have always done things as humans, uh, can be seen as playing the finite game. Right, versus game B, which is arguably the infinite game. James Koss's book, Finite and Infinite Games, which introduced and, and socialized the concepts. And actually, I think Simon Sinek uh, is just about to come out with another book by that title. A slightly different emphasis, but yeah, the idea of um, if a finite game is basically win-lose, and, and, and arguably might makes right, then the infinite game is, is the anti-rivalrous version, potentially win-win, uh, the aim is, is right, you know, basically just power makes might. And the purpose of the infinite game is not winner takes all. The purpose of the infinite game is to create conditions by which we all get to keep playing it. 
And so in some simple sense, if that's an analogy that maybe people are familiar with, you know, we can think of game A to game B in, in those terms. And so as we look around for examples, we think, oh, well, bloody hell, you know, <laughs> like evolutionary biology, that's a big weight, game theory, that's really hard to, to beat. Um, and so we've got to have something, if this is going to persist, if this is going to work, we have to have a mode of coherence or, you know, what, again, Daniel and Jordan, they've got so many great neologisms, what they might call a strong attractor, right, it has to be stronger than ego and ethnocentrism because that's what we're encoded to do. So again, to, to, and if anybody hasn't seen uh, Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hang, who's also an evolutionary biologist, they did a brilliant interview with Joe Rogan where they discuss gender and they discuss all these things, but they wind it all the way back to like mating habits of birds and all these kinds of things. And they say, hey, look, before we get into sociopolitical you know, tirades against each other, let's just look back at what are the foundational substrates that have always been. And let's take a look at that and say what are deep structures versus what are shallower social structures. Which is something that Brett and Eric have said, that our evolutionary toolkit, that's what we have to build with. We, yeah. we can't start from anywhere other than what's hardwired into us. Yeah, and, and anybody that's holding out solutions for us in this day and age that are aspirational, right, that are very much relying on the better angels of our nature, as it were, um, that is fragile as fuck. You know, the moment, you know, Mike Tyson's 101, everybody's got a plan until you get hit. Right, everybody's got a better angel till they get bitch slapped. And so the trick is, is how do we create conditions to play the infinite game together when things aren't optimal? And you know, the good news is that I think we don't actually have to start from scratch. And many of the building blocks are sort of staring us in the face. And weirdly, it's sort of if we can go in, go into the burning house fire that are the sort of uh, culture wars right now and realize that in fact, we have been inching our way towards the infinite game for some time. And it is arguably the Western tradition. My, my, I guess my question at this point is, how is this related to the war on sense-making? Why is sense-making infinite? Because in, it was in, in Daniel's explanation as well, we, get, we ended up in the same territory, but we got there through sense-making. Yes. Why are those two things linked? Well, I mean, my sense is, is that the only way we share information is electively um, or with agenda. So the question is, is what would inspire or motivate us to be both truthful and true, to be open book and transparent with each other? And that fundamentally requires trust and that fundamentally requires an alignment of motive and some sense of shared outcomes. As long as there's an us-them, as long as there's a win-lose, as long as there's a rivalrous dynamic, we will continue peeing in the pool of the information ecosystem, unintentionally and intentionally. And so we will never clean that up. The only way we can say is don't file our own nest and we actually all sleep together. And so that, that's my sense. My sense is that um, at, you know, this basically the linkage is Daniel got to the metaphor of the symbiotic bodily system. So the question is, how do we learn to play well together? The bottom line is, you know, you could abstract it to the level of the war on sense making is simply about data and information, but it's really about what do we as humans, and you know, individually and collectively, consider salient or relevant, advantageous or disadvantageous to our very human agenda. And so, how do we address, how do we address those things and agree to open source? a thriving and vibrant information ecology on behalf of effectively, you know, the old Bodhisattva 101, all sentient beings. That would be the jam. So, so the idea that we don't have to start from scratch and the fact that, um, you know, really, um, and this is right smack dab in the middle of the culture wars because there's a lot of critique these days, particularly in universities, as to why are we teaching old dead white guys? Right? And, and we need to have better representation of different cultures, different ethnicities, different backgrounds and experiences. And that's overwhelmingly worthwhile. Let us increase the span of consideration. And typically the defenders of the Western canon are often, you know, they don't exactly represent that well. They're often reactionary, curmudgeonly old white guys going rah, 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 this is the way it's always been done and this sort of, you know, some feeble appeals to tradition, you know, or excellence or whatever. And, you know, the postmodern critiques of power uh, and hegemony and all those kind of things just eviscerate 
those arguments. But I think there is actually something really important uh, that is getting lost in that firefight. And that is that, you know, if you really think about the articulation of the West, why do we, and, you know, discussing the canon, right, discuss the Greeks and the Roman Republic and the evolution of the Magna Carta and even, you know, the Arthurian legends and the, you know, the, the rule of civil law and tort law in the British judicial system and the articulation of the American Republic is that these were the seeds of the beginnings of the articulation of the infinite game. And what I mean by that, I mean, think about the Magna Carta 101. We're saying, hey, the divine right of kings, not so much, right? We weren't actually going to clip and bound that. Even though you can claim that and you have the, you have the force to enforce that, we're beginning to clip your wings. Even the legend of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round, right? The, the explicitly, ge geometrically saying we are no longer dealing with hierarchy and we are going to equivalence based on virtue and a code-based system. So this is no longer might makes right. It's right, the Knights of the Round, chivalrous knights, um, make, make might, just power. And so, and again, with, with the accumulation of civil, civil and tort law, the idea that the law sits above power, privilege, prestige, and no man is absolved. Now, that said, a, a thousand exceptions, perversions, mutations, co-optations of game theory, warping, bending, co-opting that experiment. But nevertheless, it's that experiment. And when you have, and you know, the critiques of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington being slave owners, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so we shouldn't honor them and they should always, and you're like, right, absolutely. Uh, those, those are legitimate critiques. I mean, I'll go one step further. George Washington, uh, before the Revolutionary War, his nickname in the French Indian Wars was the Butcher of Fallen Timbers. He was a cold hearted and merciless. I mean, it was like the My Lai Massacre of the 18th century. So there's no need to dress them up in sort of hagiographies that, you know, that, that acknowledge none of their humanity or culpability in the things they did. And, right, when the founding fathers of the U.S. got together, they're like, okay, we're trying to do something really hard. Um, let's look back through history and see who anybody who's come anywhere near this. And they ended up with the Republic of Rome. They ended up with, hey, do we go Nero? and the descent into empire, or do we go Cincinnatus, the reluctant gentleman farmer who is called to service and then relinquishes power the moment his service is no longer needed, and that absolutely informed Washington. And you've got Jefferson, Madison, Franklin, and they're, and they're saying, look, these are the guys with all the might. And they actually tried to set up a flexible, massively, I mean, think about it, even though it's creaking at the seams right now and, and our recent politics is damn nearly gumming up the works, they said, we've got all the toys. We have won the rivalrous game. We are going to build the conditions to play an anti-rivalrous game. Three branches of government, checks and balances, veto power, term limits, right? Constitutions, bill of rights, all men are created equal and entitled to the same things. And basically you can make the case that all of U.S. history, the Civil War, re, you know, relitigating that argument, right? Civil rights, you know, the same thing, saying, hey, we're not there yet. There was a city on a hill. There was a promise, part of this infinite game. And you think about Abraham Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address, you know, massacre in Gettysburg. I mean, tens of thousands of citizens killing each other. And he said, we're not here to honor the dead. We're here to recommit to that original promise. Martin Luther King did the same thing in his I Have a Dream speech. He said, this is not there yet. Right? We're here to say, I have a dream that there's a check that hasn't been cashed, insufficient funds. We're entitled to that thing that that infinite game promised, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Obama did it after the church bombings. He once again attempted to double down on that commitment. And, and the, 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 the critique, right? I, mean, I, was I was just, uh, I had the honor to speak at the Sandhurst Royal Military Academy in the, in the UK. And we were brought into the chapel and given a tour. And on all the columns of the chapel were the names and even brief stories of all the officers who had died in all the wars uh, that, the, that the British Army had fought in. 
and it was it was Afghanistan in the 1890s. It was Crimea. It was the Boer War in South Africa. It was World War One and Two. It was the entire spectrum. And you're like, holy shit, this is just a litany of colonialism and the projection of force around the world. And on the other hand, noble and courageous, the Charge of the Light Brigade, right? And I was thinking, it's 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 both. You know, it's absolutely both. And 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 you could see that from the from the inside, you know, the Brits absolutely felt that they were bringing civilization and justice and rightness to the world, and they were merciless bastards in doing it. And can we hold both of those things? And can we see, and, and you even think of someone like Noam Chomsky, you know, who was offered relentless critiques of American hegemony and power. Uh, around the world and his, you know, his books, Manufacturing Consent and all of those things saying democracy is basically a, a sort of puppet show sham and all of those things. And you think rather than saying, oh, you know, almost a sort of family dynamic of like, oh, the dad, you know, daddy in power, let's knock him off the pedestal. He's, di he's disappointed me and he's not all that. Rather, if we can pan back two more steps and say this articulation of the infinite game includes the exceptions, includes the contradictions, includes the hypocrisies, includes the returns to the deepest ideals, and includes the critiques. The fact that Chomsky has been a tenured professor at MIT, one of the most storied institutions on the planet, and gets to do shit like this is built in to the infinite game we've been playing. So where we are right now, uh, socio-politically around the world, is I think we are in perilous danger of torpedoing that experiment of the infinite game and having a regression to the finite game. All the populists, all the tribalists around the world, South America, the US, Europe, for sure, Africa and Asia, right? There is a, there is a return to might makes right. There is a rejection of the global centric promise of all humans are entitled to inalienable rights. It's me and mine first. And there can be, there's that irresistible adolescent temptation to say, burn motherfucker, burn. And we're going to tear it down and it's going to be better afterwards. And I think that is wildly naive. And I think that people, we will be left with the burning wreckage of what actually could have been our best bet of like, yes, this is imperfect. Yes, this is riddled with contradictions. This is riddled with capture and game theory dynamics, rent seeking behaviors, you name it. And the premise, the promise is still one of the best things we've ever had. And if anybody has had any questions about that, just check out the transition of Rhodesia to Zimbabwe and understand what has happened to the GDP, to the civil liberties, to everything in that country. And, and you think there is there's actual real merit in A, we don't have to start from scratch. B, we've got a pile of inertia and momentum moving us in the direction of the better angels of our nature. We have the systems, we have the legacy, we have the lineage, we have the stories. And can we say, in fact, that for those who have said, yeah, but that train is a mirage to me. My people, myself, my ancestors ran as fast as we could and that thing accelerated down the tracks. We had no chance of catching it. Then let's slow down that train and get people on it. Let's not blow up the tracks. And that's a, that's a critical distinction. I mean, a lot of the talk in this area is about sort of game B, game B dynamics. Are you saying that there's a kind of, that there is a trajectory within Western culture or world culture that implicitly has game B dynamics within it? Is that what you're saying? I am. I'm saying this did not spring sui generis out of nowhere. <laughs> and, the, and the notions of the infinite game were actually seeded in the last, you know, in the last three or four hundred years, you know, the French Enlightenment. I mean, I've always had issues with Steven Pinker. I've always felt that he was a bit of a whitewasher, you know, in, in the sense of like everything's getting better. And look at all these things, you know, child literacy and infant mortality and, you know, and, and the decrease in wars and conflict. And you're like, yeah, mate, but there's a lot of externalities. There's a lot of blowback. There's a lot of repercussions. You're not including in your cherry picked stats. But lately, I've really been coming around and being like, man, I get it. I absolutely get where he's taking that stand and where he's kind of like ringing the bell and saying, hey, please pay attention. Babies in bathwater. There is something absolutely cherished and tender here and essential.
And so rather than us kind of being in the realm of, you know, eggheady pundits, you know, whiteboarding a perfect future reality that no one can ever figure out how to get to, uh, my sense is, is like, let's look. The, the answer is almost always in the text. The answer is almost always in our story. And can we, can we double down on the better angels of our nature, even as we are dealing with some of the devils? And in my senses is that a lot of people in the kind of consciousness space, uh, whether that's meditation or psychedelic renaissance or, you know, you name it, but people who are sort of saying, hey, our answer is elevated consciousness. And I think they are absolutely right. Um, if we take a look at all the trend lines of what's happening in the material world, most of them go off a cliff sometime in the next, you know, three to five decades or sooner. Um, and the only sort of asymptote, the only sort of <laughs> Hail Mary, can we actually pull this off against all odds play, is some substantial and nonlinear up-leveling of human consciousness and collaboration, right? Such that that war on sense-making, right, becomes massive collaboration. And we actually become, we boost our collective inten intelligence and coordination. And no matter how cynical you are about the state of Western democracies, um, if, you, if you assign some heightened capacity to higher stages of consciousness, and even like multidimensional awareness and the universe and information theory, you can you know, take whatever level of um, wild ass guesses as to the nature of reality. Let's say you're really far up that stack. Um, still, all of it is mediated by these meat suits in 3D, right? Until further notice, consciousness is animated via cognition you know, and bodies and brains and hearts and lungs and oxygen. And every time, and no matter what our views are of this life and other lives, uh, there's, you know, with rare exceptions of like Tibetan tulkus and lamas who, you know, claim to have a uh, recollection of prior incarnations. Basically, when we lose these meat suits, it's a cold reboot and we lose all the data at a minimum. So the question is, is that where else would you choose to park your meat suit? to engage in all of those higher level pursuits, explorations, uh, even, um, even objectives, other than in a civil society with rule of law, civil rights, and protection of private properties. So you can be as cosmic and out there in your philosophies, cosmologies, ontologies, and you would still quite rationally come back around to being a highly engaged citizen that does give a shit about your vote and does give a shit about what's happening. Because the key is, obviously, how do we go from rivalrous, egocentric, ethnocentric, game A dynamics, which is arguably the sort of inheritance of homo sapiens, right? The ape who knows, but also the ape who games, the ape, the ape who is, 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 is working to win, right? To what Johan Wiesinger, the, the, the Dutch uh, theorist, called homo ludens, right? The playful ape, the ape who is playing the infinite game. And the infinite game is really only accessible, not from an ego ethnocentric level of consciousness, but from a global centric level of consciousness. And that's the critical move. How do we move as many people as possible from ego ethnocentric to global centric uh, as fast as possible? And there's something really interesting about that, those developmental moves, which is that it's a skip level play. So the only way that a baby gets to develop egocentrism Right, because you know when a when a child is born, they're in just fusion. So they've been in the womb. Me and mommy are the same organism. I have no separation. I come out of the womb. I'm still. I'm attached to the teat. Right. I'm hugging. I'm and I, there's just. I am just this blob, and I am absolutely connected to that heartbeat and that love and all of those things. And then, egocentrism comes online when I realize there's me and there's not me. There's mommy and me. And that is how the terrible twos come online. I'm like, I am a free agent. I can do things. I can move things. I can bend things to my will. Hot damn. So the only, re the only way we get to egocentric is to realize there is someone that's not me. The only way we get to ethnocentric is to go a level beyond that and realize there's someone that's not us. They're those smelly bastards across the river that talk funny and dress funny and don't deserve what they've got and we're going to take it. The only way to get to global centric is to realize this, there is something or someone that's not human. So we have to glimpse a cosmocentric perspective in order to annex a global-centric stance. 
Now, how the hell do we do that? Right? So one of the only examples I think we've really got, other than individuals sparking off, um, sort of the axial age greats of Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and Lao Tzu and, and, and that lot, um, are astronauts and the famous sort of flyover effect. Right? And this has been persistent uh, from the original Apollo missions all the way to some of the astronauts on the space station these days. But there is something absolutely profound about looking down on that little blue marble and seeing the sun come up and go around and seeing it rotate and seeing the Amazon and seeing the Nile and seeing the Himalayas and realizing, man, all the boundaries go away. I mean, all the normal cliched shit that gets said about that. And in fact, that original photo was what Stuart Brand put on the whole Earth catalog in the early 70s, right? And it was game changing. I mean, humans had never seen our home, right, from afar. And it literally was, was credited with kicking off the entire uh, environmental movement of the 70s. Now, we, you know, that doesn't scale. We can't all buy tickets to Virgin Galactic and go get our shot of that. But rather than being astronauts, you know, can we instead perhaps become psychonauts? Can we explore levels of consciousness that give us that actually lived experience, that somatic sense of I have gone beyond my tribe? And I now definitively come back to the level of global centric life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness because all men are created equal. And if they're not created equal, they are sure as shit entitled to that aspirational move. So the question then is, is how do we do that? Because it's one thing. I mean, bottom line is we can be anti rivalrous right? when there's enough to go around. And, and if we're thinking about future proofing, that isn't, that's a partial and inadequate condition, right? If it only works when everybody's got enough, that is fine, <laughs> but temporary and, and not actually likely to closely match our conditions going forward. So now let's boil this down to actually like people, because we've been talking about systems and history and culture and all of that kind of stuff. But this really comes down to people. Uh, it comes down to in a moment of choice, uh, do I open the proverbial kimono? Do I bear my heart? Do I show my cards? And do you do the same? And what I've been noticing, particularly around communities of practice that are thinking of these kinds of things and are trying to explore the way into collective coherence and ways for us to play better together, is there's this consistent and sort of, I don't know what you'd call it, sad, frustrating, concerning, but it's a, it's a pattern that seems to come up, which is that folks are uh, discussing these ideas and concepts. They are realizing, yes, game A, boo, game B, yay, you, you think the same things, we say we, we're believing the same beliefs, uh, let's get together and play. And there is often an initial spike of enthusiasm, excitement, uh, feeling met, um, and a sense of, holy shit, maybe this is how we get this done, right? Collaboration. Many of us have been carrying the burden solo, you know, and, the, and a lot of our paths to get to this conversation have been by exclusion and exception. You know, we have found ourselves persistently misfit toys, you know, persistently cast out of the socially defined norms, persistently losing at game A not because we are necessarily bad at it, we might have even been able to win at it. We've just found it distasteful or not satisfying or not congruent. So there's a lot of, you know, bumps and scrapes <laughs> we've accumulated along the way. And then we get to this place where we find our nominal allies, our nominal conspirators, those who breathe together. And there's often a spike of optimism, euphoria, possibility, and then we get to this stutter step where it's like, wait a second, if we're really going to do this post egoic thing, if we're really going to dump all of our puzzle pieces out that we've been carrying so carefully, right, and mix them all in together, and holy shit, maybe there's even a bigger picture that none of us had, but our puzzle pieces fit together beautifully. Um, wait, wait a second, am I sure? Because I've, I've taken a lot of hits to get here, and this means giving up all control. This means giving up all safety. This giving, means that giving all guarantees and even my cherished vision of the version of the future, right, that I've been living and dying for. And as we do that, as there's as that vulnerability, it's like, okay, well, I'm self-aware enough. I think this is actually, this is good pain. 
this is productive distress. I think I do need to open and relax into this. But then something fucking happens. And there's a conversation, there's a decision. We start seeing our humanity poke back through, through all the idealism. And we see somebody do something that we're like, I'm not a thousand percent sure that was quite right. We see money, power, influence, control. What do we do on Monday morning, right? Who gets the credit? Who strokes the check, right? <laughs> who gets the likes? Who gets the post? You know, who gets the funding? Who gets the peer reviewed rights? Whose name is on the, pa on the top of the paper or the book? And suddenly we go back down into the inevitable substrate of game A. And we've started out seeing each other's light from each other's light, right? In many ways, we, you know, most of us, we've gone through our lives looking for who's got the shine, right? Who's got the shine? And in, in middle school and high school, it's often those crazy charismatic kids that act out, you know, and, and, and razz the teacher and do this. But you're like, that kid's got the shine. Let me gather around them. I want to be close to them. Or the, the captain of the sports team or the star in college or, you know, or the one who always seems to know. There's always something about those folks that seems like they're on the inside of the secret. And we're drawn to them. We seek them out. We, we, that's who we feel we want to be with and our people are with. So we find each other and we say, ah, I see your light. Hail fellow, well met, right? Um, and we're drawn to that. And then as we accumulate these error messages and as we go from sort of this mirage of crystallizing infinite game B possibility, and then we start seeing oh, maybe shadow, maybe blind spot, maybe ego or pride or contraction, then boom, 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 we go back down the floorboards to seeing each other's shadow from each other's shadow. And there's this persistent pattern I've noticed is that the people we've often been closest to aligned around some of the most aspirational, positive projects possible, we often end up spitting bricks and pissed off, hacked off, cynical, ah, you don't really know them, they're not all that, or we, we end up fracturing from the very people that despite our um, mishits, despite the frictions and the tensions, we are absolutely on the same team, rowing in the same direction. And yet we end up more distant from them than we are even from the quote unquote opposition. And my sense is, is okay, so how, given all that, can we recommit to seeing each other's light from each other's light, right? And my sense is if, if you do that, like if somebody's burned you a few times, you're naive, <laughs> you know, you're the Ned Stark of the world. Right? You're like, I'm going to go with honor and duty and do the right thing. And, you know, as Cersei once said, you know, the Game of Thrones, man, you, you know, you win or you die. You know, and I don't remember who gave him that advice, but like, just don't ever go to King's Landing. In fact, I think it was Jordan that said that. We were riffing on this. He's like, the rule is if you're Ned Stark, don't go to King's Landing. So how do we hold honor and courage and, you know, and, and decency and hold up that infinite game? at the same time as just not just leaving us exposed to get s slaughtered by those folks still playing game A and, and, and manipulating the finite game. So you can't be naive, right? And, 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 and yet, on the other hand, we have to trust. We have to trust. And in fact, there's a, there's a great uh, book called The Trusted Advisor. It comes out of Duke Business School. Um, but I highly recommend folks checking it out if they're interested. But they've actually boiled trust into an actual equation. And they said that trust is credibility, like I actually have the capacity to do the things you think I can. Reliability, I do what I say I'm going to. Plus intimacy, I actually feel connected to you and you to me. I feel that you get my world, right? And that's a part of your thought process and decisions, all divided by self-orientation. And so because that's the self-orientation is the denominator, you can destroy a very high score across the top if somebody's saying, I'm not convinced we're in it for the same reasons. I'm not convinced that person isn't covertly playing game A dynamics, rivalrous dynamics with game B lip service, effectively the, the covert sociopath, right? And so... Uh, Jordan and Daniel have articulated the idea of rule omega, and we actually riffed on that uh, on that last talk together. And the idea of rule omega is basically, you know, and back to information ecology, is to say, I commit to presuming that there is signal in your noise, and that I am going to inquire until I find the truth 
that you are holding, no matter how messy or noisy it is or as you're presenting it, right? And, and they actually made an interesting clarification after that talk we had, which is that rule omega cannot be um, demanded by another. It can only be extended based on mutual agreement, based on that intimacy, right? But my sense is, is that for us to be able to, after seeing each other's shadow, go back to encouraging each other's light, right? I mean, Goethe has that great quote. He says, see a man as he is, and he will only and always be as he is. But see him as he could be and should be, and he will become what he could be and should be. So how do we do that? Right, without leaving ourselves exposed, right, at a time that's mission critical. And we've got, we've got this far, let's not shit the bed right at the end by being overly naive. Don't do the Ned Stark. And so my sense is that rule omega works best. We can create that trust, right, based on that equation, if we balance rule omega with code omega, which is that I can commit to not ignoring your shadow, not ignoring those error messages, but continuing to see you as you could be and should be, if and only if I have the confidence that we have a priori, ahead of the conflict, right, agreed to and committed to a code that is higher than ourselves and our own personal preferences. Because particularly, and back to the notion of sociopaths, right, particularly in the postmodern, culturally relativistic, um, social justice world. There is a cult of sensitivity. And my process and my experience and, and weaponized nonviolent communication, I hear what you're saying, but what's true for me is, and all of that shit show, right? What typically happens is if we try and clear those issues, we get lost in that space. And I'm like, you're, you're making the mouthy sounds. I don't buy a fucking word of it, right? And I'm just actually just going to back away from you now. And rather than us having this expanded global centric sphere of concern, we end up shrinking our circles to the people who we actually still do trust. And there's just no way that scales. There's no way if every time we bump up against another potential ally, we get the error messages, we attempt to resolve, it seems to be squishy or weaponized, and our efforts to deepen trust actually divide us and create more suspicion. That's the wrong vectors, right? So my sense is, is what could code Omega look like? And again, the same argument about saying, hey, we don't need to build or theorize game B from scratch, right? The seeds of the infinite game are actually in our living tradition. Um, the, you know, and specifically, I mean, just, you know, to go back to colonial expansion, I mean, it was god awfully brutal. But also look at the tribalism, look at the factionalism, look at all the places in the world where there, where there are far more regressive. And in fact, we're seeing it in the US these days, which is take out career professionals, install cronies. This is no different than Saddam Hussein dealing with his village and clan and populating the Iraqi government. We're seeing the resurgence of that. That is not an improvement. That's not an advantage. So what code can we install? So we've got the infinite game over the last three, four, five hundred years, depending how far back you want to trace it. We've also got the obvious shit, right? I mean, Rabbi Hillel, who was one of the prime inspirations for uh, Jesus of Nazareth's teaching. I mean, he basically cribbed a lot from Hillel. There's a great story where Hillel uh, was cornered by the Pharisees, and they were basically in a showdown because he was a bit of an iconoclast and shit stirrer. And, uh, and they were like, okay, you need to get out of Jerusalem. And he's like, no, no, you guys need to get out of Jerusalem. And they're like, no, we got a lot of people, you, you piss off. And he's like, okay, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. They, they said, okay, we'll challenge you to basically a poetry slam. He's like, you, you know, if you can recite all of scripture on one leg while standing on one leg without touching your other foot, then we'll leave. Uh, but if you can't, uh, then you have to bugger off and never come back. He's like, you're on. So he stands on one leg and he says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The rest is mere commentary. So we don't need to overbuild this, right? You can take, uh, what's his face? Is it Don Miguel Ruiz, The Four Agreements, right? And just, you know, I mean, that, that's been a very popular book in the last decade or so, but I mean, it's pretty bog standard simple. I think it's something like, you know, basically, you know, and this is paraphrasing, he's like, tell the truth lighten up, don't make shit up, and do your best. And you're like, okay, that works. <laughs> right? that, that is enough to be dangerous. That is enough to act on. And so, you know, if we, if we realize that ahead of time, we have committed 
to a code, then I can trust that when I transgress, I will acknowledge it. You don't have to be vigilant. We don't have to be down in that level of you holding onto your shadow, right? Watching out for mine because you trust. And this is, you know, the old back to, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm showing up as hopelessly traditionalist in this conversation, which is kind of funny because I'm typically not. But the idea, maybe it's because we're here in London, um, but that idea in English culture, right, which is, you know, the phrase, that's not cricket. And that doesn't mean we're playing cricket, <laughs> you know, or someone's picked up a baseball bat. It means that is a violation of the spirit of the game. Right? And the spirit of the game, the spirit of the infinite game, is that I self-police. The spirit of the infinite game is might doesn't make right. Just because I'm winning doesn't mean I get to bend the rules in my favor. Right? The spirit of the game is when the ball is out, I call it. Even when I lose that point or the match. Right? And so if we have the ability, so I think there is something, particularly in um, education over the last generation or two, that has been, you know, self-esteem, self-esteem, self-esteem. Anybody can grow up to be an astronaut. And your, your, your most feeble effort gets praised, and you're wonderful and perfect as you are. We've kind of really diminished uh, the role of shame in society. Now, guilt, the idea like I'm worthless, and I don't, you know, and I don't have enough, and I don't deserve, absolutely, we should lift people up from experiencing needless guilt. But shame, I think, is a massively underutilized social nutrient, which is basically saying shame is I have transgressed our cherished norms and I feel that in my core and I am willing to atone for it. And if we reintroduce healthy shame based on code omega so that we can self-police so that each other can see each other as we could be and should be, if we can engage in the peak experiences, right, the astronaut flyover effect, but internal consciousness, if we can use those peak experiences to affirm our shared humanity and come back and mend and integrate our trauma, right, so that we don't get triggered, so that we don't go back down the slide to evolutionary, biological, game theoretical, rivalrous bullshit. Right? If we can then connect with each other in communion, right? something larger than ourselves, something bigger than ourselves, then we've got a shot. You know, then we've got a shot at unlocking our collective capacity. Then we've got a shot at unlocking our collective humanity. And then we've got a shot at dusting off this banged up, damn nearly broken seed of the infinite game and seeing it grow and flourish into a tree that shades the world. Let's say we get to good, a good sense-making ecology, as Daniel did such a great job laying out in the first half of this, this conversation. And, and he was predominantly focusing on the systems and the structures, literally the, kind, you know, the, the sort of you know, exterior quadrants right, of system, society, technology, um, and talked a little bit about the interior of an individual making sense of that polluted information ecology. And are people holding things back? Are we sharing clearly? Is there a difference between truth and truthfulness of signal? All those kinds of important points. And then we're all getting to, yes, 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 yes. Now the next crux is how do we do collective, coherent sense making together? How do we drop into what Victor Turner, the anthropologist, um, called communitas, right? You could also, Keith Sawyer at the University of North Carolina, you know, described it as group flow. And I think that it's, an, I think they're pretty, pretty damn near analogous, right? It's basically the idea of what happens when we all get together and something more than what us each could have come up with individually emerges from that thing, right? And so there's a lot of wondering and there's a lot of theorizing. There's not a lot of demonstrable practice yet. And even Otto Schama, who's, a, who's a, a friend and colleague of ours, he's at MIT, he popularized Theory U, which is all about co-creative emergence. There are world cafes, there are varying other modalities around this. Most of them are all about just fucking talking better with each other, which I don't find super compelling. Um, I think that's pretty, pretty weak sauce when it comes to overriding all of evolutionary biology, the prison house of language, and game theory 
dynamics. I just don't think they're really adequate. They're aspirational, and you get a bunch of tightly self-selected people in a group like that, and they can sometimes, with a lot of time and effort, and often not a lot, with not a lot of practical outcomes. Um, so my sense is, is if you look at it, and you look to see, well, where do people get into communitas, high-performing communitas, true group flow on a regular basis? They are almost always um, violently meritocratic organizations. So if you take special operations military, they brutally select for who gets in, um, they massively overtrain uh, for what they're going to do, um, and if you can't, like there's a shared knowledge and a felt sense by the masters in the group of the thing we're trying to get to. What does it feel like when we draw? What does it feel like when egos dissolve and we create a high functioning hive mind? So there are people that are anchoring it, and then as you bring in new people to that, it's a pretty brutal test of can you get there with us? Can you contribute to that thing or not? And so it's sort of up or out. And we will swap you with the next person in line for someone that can. If you think of Miles Davis's jazz bands, right? I mean, he was a genius musician and was utterly ruthless on who could hang in his band, right? If you couldn't swing, if you couldn't hit the chord changes, if you couldn't play at that level, you would be swapped for someone who could. Right, and the same with the Golden State Warriors or the Lakers or any of the you know any of the you know European Football League. Right, I mean you look at Real Madrid, you look at any of these teams, um, and you would make that case as well. They are ruthlessly meritocratic, right, and you have to have the skill set to do the thing. You know, alternately, so you could, let's say you know alternately you've got a lot of egalitarian communities of practice gatherings, etc., um, particularly in the kind of the progressive space. Uh, Extinction Rebellion would be an example among thousands, um, where the value set is very different. They're saying, hey, we are trying to get to this co-creative emergence via consensus, via inclusion, and it's very difficult. So just to acknowledge that so far, this thing, this ineffable drop into, communi into communitas or into high-level coherence is rare and tricky. So first, can we just acknowledge that? <laughs> right? If it were easy, we'd already all be doing it. Um, secondly, is that the, m the majority of the exemplars we have of it are tightly controlled, highly focused, and quite exceptional. When we then just pivot over without necessarily noticing we've done so, and we end up in a, in, in a community of practice with a different set of values, which are generally skewed towards inclusivity, everyone having a voice, which are, those are noble ideals. They just might be antithetical to what we've known to date about how to get into those states. And in that light from light, shadow from shadow experience that we were describing earlier, I think that's kind of what happens. So you might find a lot of people that are paying lip service to shared espoused ideals. We get together, we say, we're going to try and do this thing. And whether that's the, the early stages of game B, you know, you know, five, ten years ago, right? Or whether it's any of the movements right now on, you know, future proofing the world. You get a large group of people together. They all think they're on a shared mission. You start getting the error messages. You start seeing shadow from shadow. You start increasing doubt and decreasing trust. And what do people do? They typically just shrink their sphere of concern. They're like, they create breakoffs. Right? And actually, Daniel, I think, mentions that in some of his other descrip descriptions of group information ecology. You create factions and defections, right? splintering, withholding of information. And basically, intuitively, while it feels shitty and it feels like backstabby tribal politics quite often, as we live through those things, it's actually a rational movement, which is, oh, shit, if we can't get there with all of us, because we can't trust all of us to, to know how right, and to play well, then the very natural thing for me to do is shrink my sphere to the people I do still have trust with and do think we can cohere with until you get smaller and smaller. But obviously, that's antithetical to any of our hopes and sense of urgency about scaling this thing. So step one is just to identify, are we right, valuing exclusivity, right, whatever it takes to get the high hard goal done, or do we privilege inclusivity? Right? And then in the polarities mapping model, there's basically saying identify the upsides of what can happen if we do get it right, but also identify the downsides. What happens if we over-index to this pole and we start seeing the negatives? Right? So for exclusivity, 
right? It would be that it's a small, agile group of people. They're deeply skilled. There's very little clutter or distraction, and we actually get there. We get to coherence, and we get to coherence in a high trust, low friction framework. Fantastic. But the downside of exclusivity is you leave a lot of people on the sidelines, right? It can create resentment, it can create blowback, very difficult to scale, and often tends up being sort of tops down dissemination. Right, which is you know sort of you know, potentially you know, overtly hierarchic or exclusive. Got it. Right. Well, let's take a look at what happens. What are the good things of inclusivity? Everybody has a seat at the table. There's a diversity of voices. There's an inclusion of former outgroups. Right. There's a heterodox nature to our meaning making and sense making together. Right. And there's a sense of this actually just you know more closely matches our humanitarian values in the first place. What are the downsides? Well, we're all acutely aware of the downsides of you know, pathological inclusion, which is that any singular voice can hijack the thread. It's very difficult. It's sort of like a hippie drum circle you know, you know, versus a master djembe player. Right? You just get noodly mud. Um, things take an awfully long time quite often to get to consensus. Consensus is fragile and can be firebombed by anybody playing an SJW card or any other kind of agitator, uh, victim, drama triangle kind of dynamics. Um, and because we value inclusivity, we are obligated to stop the presses when anyone says, help, help, I'm being oppressed, right? And so the ability to weaponize cult of sensitivity, nonviolent communication, and all those things is abundant. And when you have narcissists or, or sociopaths or just, you know, chatty Cathy's and needy Neds <laughs> infiltrate those scenes, and they often do, then it never gets off the ground. So the question is, how do we steer between those? And I think that that's, you know, and so a couple of examples of that. Um, my sense is, obviously, is there a both and? Is there a way that we can acknowledge this is hard, it's subtle and nuanced, and it actually requires a surprising amount of skill and facility, and even the ability to drop ego. Right, Gabbard, I think, you know, as you've explored the difference between the IDW, the intellectual dark web, and what were the, what were the tenor and flavors of some of those conversations versus more of these kind of emerging conversations, I would sense, I mean, one of them is rational, separate egos slinging <laughs> right, thoughts, constructs at each other, versus people looking and listening to play jazz, all right? And so you can make a kid, there's almost that watershed moment. So how might we have the best of both of these things? High and hard are rare for now, and we're gonna need some, we're gonna need a vanguard. And on the other hand, all of us or none of us, we, it's really critical that we find ways to help this propagate. So you sketched out the ego to ethno to kind of global centric perspective, which um, a lot of people will probably be familiar from Ken Wilber's work, for example, the idea that we have to kind of go from one to the other. In the society today, especially kind of on the left, there's a real ambivalence or outright rejection of nationalism, for example, and ethnocentrism. Is your sense that that's something we have to go through to get to world centric? Because for me, certainly, I feel like unless we're stable in our individual identities and probably proud of proud of our own history mm -hmm. it's very difficult then to bypass straight to a kind of global centric consciousness yeah and i mean i think um, a general premise of development is that skipping steps leads to dissociation and pathology and so um, the question of have we securely enough annexed our ethnocentric awareness um, i think it's fair to say that the last century has been increasingly dissociative People lived in villages that where their parents and their grandparents had grown up. There was the migrations to urban areas, you know, the situation that average American families move seven times in their adult lives. A majority of people live in different states than their parents. Their children don't grow up knowing multiple generations of their family. There's this absolute, I mean, they often don't even know their neighbors. Ge geographic right next doors, let alone generations of who they are and where they've come from. So I think you can make a case that we're in a sort of aberrant condition developmentally. We've become atomized, fragmented, hypermobile, non-local consumer identities, right? And so that is a problem. And there's been some fascinating research on kids that do know their grandparents on both sides of their family. And just, just those extra, you know, just three generations being aware of each other, in, you know, decreases likelihood of anxiety, depression, suicide, boost test scores, boost college attendance. It's, it's literally the, one of the most healthy inoculations 
for a kid, you know, adverse childhood events, abuse, bad things that are happening, they, can, they are more resilient. So it's a little bit like extending the wheelbase on a car. When you have a long limousine and it goes down the road, it's very, very smooth. When you have a short little electric car, it's bumping up and down all the way. And so when our only perspective is our life fractured from everything around us, the world, every hit, right, sends us spinning. So I have wondered, I thought, okay, take every alt-right, neo-Nazi, Aryan nation, whatever, give them a 23 and me test, <laughs> you know, be like, hey, clearly, you are yearning for an identity, right? Let's actually steer into that skid. Go and study yourself. Understand where you are. Dollars to donuts, you're not fucking Viking. I'll tell you that much, <laughs> right? And then you get to wrestle with and incorporate that. So I think it, it, there is a bit of a go back to go forwards. Um, it's almost like the houses in Hogwarts, right? You know, during the Quidditch matches, we're, we're, we're tooth and nail. But at the end of the day against the Death Eaters, we're Hogwarts. And I think there has to be some element of, yes, let's go back and truly annex where we're from so that we can opt into participation in the global human story. Well done for making it to the end. Just wanted to let you know a few things we've got coming up, including the biggest event we've ever done, the Rebel Wisdom Festival, which will be a mix of ideas and dialogues between people like Daniel Schmachtenberger, Benita Roy, Rupert Sheldrake, John Bavaki, and many more. And because wisdom isn't just intellectual, it's also about practice. We'll be offering experiences like circling, different interpersonal dialogue, mindfulness, breath work, and many other with world-class facilitators. And if you're enjoying the content, you can help us make more by joining the Rebel Wisdom Club, which will give you discounts on the courses and the events, and also access to a load more content on the website, including all of our live events. It'll also give you access to our growing community, which is something we want to make a real focus for 2020, adding more meetups and other services for members. So, hope you enjoyed the film and see you soon.